Hello and welcome back to the official Scottish Rugby Podcast together with the Royal Bank of Scotland. On this week's episode, we're joined by Scotland and Edinburgh star Jamie Ritchie, plus Sheila Begbie, Director of Rugby Development, and Vicky Cox, Competition and Compliance Manager, are on the podcast as the 2019-20 season is class null and void. Jamie, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, doing well, thank you. Just uh, enjoying a bit of downtime, I guess. And, and where are you just now? Are you, are you still in Edinburgh or are you... No, so when the lockdown was announced, my partner and I decided to uh, come down to their parents in air just so we'd have a wee bit more room. They've got a big garden and stuff, so we decided to come down here just so we weren't cooped up in our flat in Edinburgh. Nice, nice. And always, as always, I have with me Al and Chris Patterson. Lads, how are you getting on? I'm fine, Jamie. I'm fine. Um, getting used to this, actually. It's uh, It doesn't seem like a week since I spoke to you last time or since it last recorded which I think is quite a good sign um, homeschooling's improving I think I don't know about Al I uh, seem to be finding a groove in that and then just just fighting hard to, to stay active and uh, and just yeah just keep positive all, for, all fine here um, we're into a nice routine um, filling the weekend was an interesting one because it was like yeah. well, what's different you know what's different from this to like well, there's no uh, kids clubs or anything on it at night, so you all of a sudden got a, a huge amount of time at night that you wouldn't normally have, and you're normally doing the kind of daddy daycare cat taxi. Um, but we had a really nice weekend, just a lot of time in the back garden. What time does your homeschooling start, Al? You see, you've got a routine. Are, are you running the time? <laughs> well, you see, I'll be honest, Mossy, I'm not running it. Uh, but um. Um, I sh- so the the like breakfast and everything's at the usual times from. from Generally, with the kids, it's from about eight. They get up normally a wee bit earlier than that, potter about by themselves, um, and then try and get them active every morning. So either go for a walk or uh, they've been doing the Joe Wicks uh, body coach yeah. stuff, um, uh, and then get get them into the day. Um, and it all seems to be <laughs> all seems to be going well. Although I actually did go for the the one shop a week yesterday about half two. Uh, and when she came back, I was in the front room working. Uh, the wee the wee man Rory was in the living room playing a Nintendo Switch with no clothes on, and Kate was upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Kate was upstairs on Zoom to all our friends, and she said, "She was like, what's happened to you?'" And I said, "Ah, well, school's finished. Like they're out, <laughs> they're just doing their own thing." That's afternoon break, Al. There's your answer right there. <laughs> Jamie, Richie, you, you, you've got um, you've got quite a young family as well. How, how are you finding it? I guess one of the positives with this is you get to spend more time with them this time of year. Yeah, 100%. It's nice to to be spending more time with them. Like you wake up with them in the morning, you're not getting ready for work, so you can kind of potter about with them a bit more and enjoy sitting down and stuff, which has been really nice for us. Um found that when we were stuck in Edinburgh a bit, I was, my temper was getting shorter every day because you're not used to being with them 24-7. <laughs> so that was that was quite tough, a bit of an adjustment. <laughs> but um, How old are you two, Jamie? Uh, two and four, two and four. So we're doing a wee bit of homeschooling with the wee man. Uh, Ava's not interested in that at the moment. But uh, now nah, Oscar, we're doing a wee bit of homeschooling. So trying to get him to read and, and she, count and stuff like that. Is she school on, next but, year? Oh, uh, we're kind of deciding because he's because he's a December birthday, so we've got the option to do this year or next year. So we're kind of just humming and hawing about what we do just now, but we'll wait and see. And I guess like most of you be doing homeschooling, but I guess it'll be, there'll be a lot of PE going on just now, will there not? Yeah, as I said last week, as I said last week, there's a lot of PE, there's a lot of games. That's basically for my benefit as much as anything else. But no, we're uh, we, yeah, I, I, I'm, as I said before, I think it's, it seems to be running better this week. We're, we're trying not to stick to times because it just quite often ends up and everybody shouting and screaming at each other. But um, we would have had a few late slips, I think. Um, we <laughs> missed morning registration a couple of times last week, I'll no lie. But um, now we're working hard. At, um, the school has been brilliant uh, um, with teachers giving updates, teachers uh, giving kind of information as to what to work on, what's this, that next thing. Um, it's been really, really, really good, uh, and we've been doing a lot of baking, a lot of home baking. For scones, with cakes, with banana loaves. Yeah, we've been baking as well. Baking, that's a favourite. My kids have gotten into this thing on Netflix called um, Sugar Rush, which is, a, I think, it's like an American Bake Off. So they have these ideas of baking some of these show-stopping cakes, um, <laughs> and yeah, they're, they're, they're improving. They taste good. Taste good. But um, so there's a lot of baking. I, I even turned my hand to 
making a few scones the other morning just to, oh, uh, lovely. to pass the time. A nice, yeah, but no cream though, just jam, just jam, no cream. But sorry, quick follow up question there, Mossy. You said jam, butter and jam, or just jam? nah, just jam, butter, just butter jam. and jam, oh, surely. Butter and jam. Yeah, same. Yeah. No, nah, I'm, nah. If there was cream, it would be a wee bit jam and cream, but no, uh, there was no cream, so it's just jam. I, oh, I, I, it, like you're entitled to your own opinion. I mean, you're wrong, but um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would always have butter and jam. But look, if that's the way you do help, things, that's absolutely fine. Help me out here, Jamie's. What's? Uh, it was a fruit scone. Was a fruit Actually, scone? Uh, there wasn't a lot of dried fruit. It was a fruit scone. There wasn't a lot of dried fruit left in the cupboard, but I found some cranberries and some sultanas and raisins. So it was a <laughs> it was a copious fruit scone, Jamie. What would you t- talk to me? Is it, I, are you just going jam or are you going butter? If I if I had the option on a on a fruit scone, I'd go butter and jam. But I can deal with just jam. Oh, I really? wouldn't go just I'd never go just butter. <laughs> oh no, never just butter. No. Never Maybe just a butter. cheese scone would be just butter, but never never fruit scone. Oh sweet scones all the way. Right, no, Jamie, get no control secret. of this. <laughs> Jamie Millen, get control of this. I was just I was just about to say to anyone who's still listening, let's go and talk a little bit about the uh, about the about the rugby. It's No, wait a minute. Have... I wanted to talk about my PE, my World Cup. Oh sorry, Al. At lunch sorry. Time. You digress, yeah, sure. I'll let you go back, no problem. No, no. well you say we digress. What is this if not a, a huge digression? Um <laughs> we we, uh, every lunchtime it's the part I look forward to the most we go we have a lunch and then we go out for a uh, half an hour world, game of World Cup in the back garden uh, you won yet? pick your own team uh, go uh, no I've not won yet um, but they go classic you know goalie goes in uh, whoever scores first goes in and then whoever scores next it's a final first to two um, oh nice between against the 11 year old and the 6 year old a uh, couple of injuries one fight um, nice. No, it was me and my son, um, but I don't know. <laughs> a couple of yellow cards and a sending off. It's it's been great fun. Gen- generally, great fun. Speaking of football, uh, Jamie, is that something that you played in in school? When did you first come to rugby? Were you playing any other sports before? Um, so I did a little bit of judo when I was younger, and then kind of everyone plays football at school, don't they? It was one of those things. Uh, don't you hear my son banging at the door? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, so I played a bit of football at school, uh, mainly in the goal, to be honest. Um, but I was one of those goalies that wanted to play in the outfield, so I'd just carry it from the back and try and, and then obviously didn't tend to go well. But no, I, I never really enjoyed rugby. football. Yeah, basically. <laughs> a sweeper keeper. A sweeper keeper, aye. I uh, did a bit of judo. Um, my judo and rugby kind of started around about the same time when I was like seven or eight. And then they kind of went hand in hand until I was uh, about 15 when I stopped doing judo after I moved to Strath. Uh, played cricket in the summer. But uh, yeah, those are my three main sports, I'd say. But you say you did a little bit of judo, though. You were a, you're not a, you medal, did you not, in the championships back in the day? Uh, I think I, yeah, I did all right. Was Scottish champion twice, uh, was silver medal. Did all right, British. here we go. Um, and then I won this, <laughs> the what, British schools. One of those guys. British schools once, uh, but yeah, no, I, did, I was young, so, so it was like, and I was, I think when I was doing well, my weight category that I was fighting, I was like under sixty kilos or something. So it was a long time ago. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff you learn there is applicable in rugby, though, isn't it? Like knowing your body, knowing, well, having a core strength, having to move people off the ball. You'll see quite a, a kind of correlation in, in some of the stuff you're working now. I assume. Yeah, definitely. I think it helps uh, for certain parts of the game, especially around about the breakdown and stuff like that. And uh, other bits, like a bit of injury prevention, knowing how to fall. I think there would be times where you end up in like a bit of a compromising position, and you need to learn how to, you need to know how to get out of it. So sometimes I've probably avoided some injuries by knowing how to fall properly and stuff like that. And I know that you boys did some judo uh, during your rugby world cup preparations. Yeah. Did. Uh, did you have to step in and do a little bit of training, a little bit of teaching, or were you? Did you keep that quiet and just go in and just absolutely melt some boys? Uh, no, everyone kind of knew that I'd done it, so I think everyone was kind of gunning to try and beat me, um, which wasn't that fun for me. But to be fair, when I did judo, you know, I liked do a lot of the stuff on my feet, so I liked standing up and trying to throw people. Whereas the stuff that we did in the World Cup was all on the ground, which was okay and uh, it was still good fun. But I, I always preferred being up on my feet. Al Mossy, Jamie talked about the, the judo and, and and how that was used in preparation in rugby and Mossy, you said there's a correlation between the two but was judo something that you guys ever focused on or, or tried uh, when you were playing? 
Not for me. Well, not growing up, certainly. It was never something I did. Um, we we did train it a, a few years ago. There was a, a pre-season we used to do kind of fitness stuff, but it was more kind of mixed martial arts, fitness. But you picked up one or two bits and pieces. But um, yeah, as Jamie said, it was <laughs> it just ended up in a, a kind of a, a scrap, really. Everybody trying to throw each other around. But the, the technical stuff was really important. I think more so now, where the laws have changed a lot around the breakdown. And and opponents are so strong over the ball. Opponents are so, you know, technically good. So just sheer force now won't move somebody who's in that position. So we're actually using your body, knowing which way to push and pull, working together. I think about a choke tackle, for example. You have to have two defenders working together rather than, uh, you know, one trying to get a player down to the deck, another one keeping up. So there's a lot of elements that are quite, quite important. Um, but I think we're even getting past that now in terms of getting players off the ball or getting this jackler off the ball. Even, I think that the problem is now, if, as soon as you let a player in, it's almost impossible to move that player so that it becomes not a not a, a, a process of getting, getting better at clearing out. It actually becomes a process of not letting that defending player in. So you have to be really quick, work on your footwork yeah. in the tackle, work on your presentation in the tackle. The clearer has to be there really quickly. Or if you can get the offload away and, and take that breakdown of the game, it speeds it up, and you know, as we said, it kind of suits a lot of what the Scottish players do. Yeah, when when that race, we we did quite a lot of judo. Gregor Gregor Townsend um, when he came in at Glasgow. Um, Gregor knows you and Burton quite well, so we used to be through at Rathro from time, and it was hard, hard work. The two things that stand out for me was we used to do cartwheels to warm up, and watching Johnny Gray do a cartwheel was absolutely <laughs> um, And the, the other one, and and uh, Jamie will be able to. Uh, tell us was this, whether this was even legal in judo at the time but a one bit of advice I remember from the grappling stuff on the ground and the clear out stuff is wherever you take the head the body will follow yeah. now, clearly clearly that has been uh, disbanded from the laws of rugby and you can no longer take the head somewhere so the body follows but that's the kind of stuff we were learning um, you know intricacies of getting somebody off that ball by you know manipulating their head Is that could you do that in, in judo at the time Jamie or was that Slightly yeah, so, for that as well. Yeah, no, you can. So you can control the head in terms of like how you move people around that. So choking and arm bars are all in; they're all fair game. Um, in terms of, but you can't literally strangle someone. But in terms of, you can't touch the face either. But you can move the head, so you can use the lapels on the jackets to to manipulate the neck. You can't physically grab someone's side of the head and move it. But there's like ways of of moving the head as you say and it tends to be people don't want their head pointing the wrong way so they tend to move with it well, well the things you used to get away with at the breakdown when you arrived a wee bit late and there was like guys like like to your point mostly not being able to move them and I, I think guys like Ross Rennie like Donny McFadgen I'm going back a bit uh, Rory Best for Ireland and from Ulster when he got there you just didn't move him uh, unless you physically tried to yeah, manipulate his head but clearly for the, for the safety of the game, it's good that that has come out. I think when you go back to that, though, Al, and the names you mentioned, at that time in that era, there was maybe one, two players, three at most, and each team that would be comfortable over the ball in that position. Think of George Smith for Australia. You know, these guys kind of brought it in. Whereas now, everybody in all positions is comfortable in that position over the ball defensively. So it, it is moving away from it in terms of, from a safety perspective as well, but in terms of, Actually, prevention's better than cure. Just don't let the defender in. Work harder on your attack. Manipulate the defence, you know, with the ball in hand, and keep keep the ball alive. Like if you if you can if you can get enough momentum and and get that ball away, you're, you're taking away the strength of the opposition. Really, if you're not letting them get in, so so that's definitely something that you know when the, when the game gets back up and running, I think we'll see uh, in a move towards just just getting away from that jackal or keeping the ball away from the jackal. How, how tall are you, Jamie? Uh, about six four. So, so the, like to your point, Mossy, the guys that were good at it were all the guys that were about were short. say five. Yeah, short, stocky. Mm-hmm. Uh, the vast mm-hmm. majority of guys that were almost over the ball before they even tried to. Not like like six four, six and above. Like <laughs> it was never a position that I felt overly strong in. Uh, when you were trying to bend yourself from six foot eight to try and clasp yeah. onto the ball, there's folk are hitting you from all sides. But guys like Jamie show that you know you don't need to be five foot ten to be good at it. But yeah, I completely agree with you. The 
the less competition there is for that ball, the, the better the attacking team is. I, th- I think as well that it's, it's the role of the player who's Jacqueline. I think it, it's it's changed a little bit. In essence, that player in that Jacqueline position should be in trying to win the ball. So the lost eight, you have to have a play at the ball. Whereas now, I think a lot of it is just clamping over the ball and stopping the attack, continuing to play. So if you can go back to a mindset of getting in, actually taking the ball with you, getting the ball away, you get the reward from a turnover. But a lot of it now is just slowing the possession down to try and win a penalty. And I think it's better for the game if the mindset around the jackler was to get in, get the ball and get out. Then it would maybe take away that compromising position that you, you could be in for a longer duration that maybe increases the chance of injury as well. No, I was going to say, I think even in the last couple of years, in terms of like, as you say, clamping on the ball, uh, it makes it's become a lot harder to win penalties, I'd say. I think you need to be on it for a lot longer now than you used to be have because referees are giving the the attack more of an opportunity to try and get you off it, to try and en- encourage the guys who are going for the ball to then try and come away with it, like go for a clean turnover rather than trying to win the penalty. Mm-hmm. And what about the te- what about the technicalities of the clear out, Jamie? Because you that you must have had to change that massively in the last few years because you just don't get away. Like I remember first going into Scotland camp when it was Jim Telford that was coaching. It was and it was launch rocket. He wanted you to yeah, take off right. from about from about four <laughs> meters away and just fly into the guy as hard as possible. <laughs> so it's moved on a bit from that. But in the last couple of years, it must have moved on again massively, is it not, Jamie? With what you've got to do when you approach the ruck. Yeah, I think so, and and the neck roll being taken out of the game makes such a difference. But around about in terms of entering through the gate, the gate essentially now is pretty non-existent. I'd say you have to enter from your own side. So we talk a lot about uh, coming in at forty-five. So if you can catch someone who's jackaling square on, if you can catch them kind of just on the side, it's very hard for them to stay in that strong position. So. Ideally, if if you're coming in trying to stop someone getting over the ball, you beat them to the you win the race essentially. So you beat them over the ball and you get in there before they can. Um, but if it comes down to you having to be physical and coming at a slight angle to try and get them off balance, probably is what you work on the most. Jamie, I just want to go back to your point around the the breakdown and how it's changed. But it's clear that you really do enjoy the the physical nature of your role and and the game itself. How much do you relish these? these big games and, and being involved in these kind of bruising encounters? Uh, relish is a, is a funny word to use. I'd say <laughs> you don't look forward, yeah. <laughs> you don't look forward to the feeling afterwards. Um, but in terms of any, it, like the position I play in, in any game of rugby, you're going to be, you're going to have to be involved in some physical encounters and you want to test yourself against the best players in the world. So that usually the bigger games is when you're going to come up against them. So you look forward to that. But for me, it's just about trying to win. And uh, if I can do anything to try and get the ball back or try and keep the ball for our team, then that's what I'll, that's what I'll do. On Jamie's point there, Jamie, what is the one that you you enjoy the most? Is it the is it the clear out, the turnover, the big carry, the the big massive tackle, uh, or is it the chip kick over the top and regather? Like, <laughs> is there anything that stands out? I like I like winning turnovers. That's probably the thing that I enjoy doing most so I feel like I've probably played my best in a game where I've got a few turnovers definitely Mossy what was yours? Um, I'd probably say open field running to be honest just I I love the feeling of identifying space trying to get through it Uh, I probably look at the game slightly differently to you two really in terms of your positional sense but also just I see the game as an evasive game as you guys Nah that's nonsense Exactly. I told you. I told you it was different. I told you it was different. Like you, you get uh, a lot of the contact, the physicality, the, the aggression. It's all still there, but actually, that is secondary to me looking for space. Whereas I think, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I, you guys, the, and it has to be like that up front. The, the contact, the aggression, that has to be primary, and then the attacking space but secondary. So it's maybe the, the difference between forwards and backs. But for me, it was definitely. Running, identifying space, accelerating through it, beating players, uh, and, and what was I say avoiding, <laughs> avoiding you lot. Uh, what about you? Um, uh, it's got to be the line out steal, doesn't it? It's the most important part of the game at a crucial time. I remember you tell me what you you your biggest or the least favourite part of the game was Al. Uh, where's this going? <laughs> okay, no, it's not seriously. I remember you saying we had a discussion about this years and years ago about kickoff reception. 
be, being 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 lifted being lifted by two others to try and get the right position at the right time for the ball to land under pressure. Uh, you didn't enjoy that, did you? Hardest skill in rugby. I agree. Uh, uh, I spent as a young lad, Todd Blackadder, hours and hours and hours of him coaching myself and the rest of the second rows, and we did a lot of groundwork. And then you kind of brought it back up, and then for, went through the stage of wearing gloves because I thought it helped me you know, get in the right, pos- <laughs> get in the right position. <laughs> uh, but that, I mean, that's a satisfying one as well. When you get that right, when somebody like back when when I was playing Jamie, when somebody like Ronan Agara seemed to hang it about seventy five meters in the air, and you had the whole of the Irish Park and Munster Park running at you. If you got that right and regathered it, that was a, that was brilliant. Um, and I'll still when I'm watching games. I'll cheer more for the guy who steals a line out or catches a kickoff reception that's come down from fifty meters up than I do for the 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 back who's jinked his way in and out and scored a try. Um, but as as you say, Mossy wired up slightly differently. That is a hard skill, though, Jamie. Even now, isn't it? Like, do you you're quite often well lifted in the line out, but do you, do you ever lift it at kickoffs to catch above your head? Um, usually, like. Is sit in the middle like with a single lift so sometimes you have to do it and uh, when I was involved with the sevens we had to practice that quite a lot yeah uh, yeah. as you say it is a hard skill it's kind of judging where the ball is going to land behind you because you're going to be up in the air catching it rather than catching it on the floor that's probably the difficult skill yeah. and is it harder with a single lift or is it easier because there's only two moving parts rather than three moving parts I'd say it's probably harder with the double lift because you think about who's lifting you as well you've got two front rowers usually so yeah. that They've got to be in sync with you, trying to get to you at the same time, which probably makes it a bit more difficult. Whereas if you've just got a single lift behind you, it's usually either another back row or you're lifting a centre. So you can kind of watch the ball together and kind of, it's, it's much easier. Rather than three working parts, two working parts is probably a bit easier. See, we're right back to this again, Al, this forwards and backs thing. See, when you're at the back as a full back, you've got nobody lifting you. You just have to jump it up and catch it yourself. So. You know, you guys get it easy up there. The ones I don't envy though are the ones where, uh, and you see, you see some bad injuries for it. When you, when, from a fullback, you've got to come charging onto the ball, launch yourself as high as you can, and catch it in traffic. And it's a landing process. And oh, oh, very much like good getting in the air, catching the ball. That I mean, not belittling that skill. That's a, obviously a skill in itself. But it's a landing safely in and amongst traffic. That yeah, I wouldn't fancy that. So I, I wouldn't necessarily swap them. The, bit, the, the most important thing about that is, and again, we're back to the prevention is better than cure, is staying on the move the whole time. So you're totally right. If you misjudge a kick or you're caught on your heels and you have to come so far for it, now sometimes you can't help it if it's a poor kick that you, they're trying to receive. You, you, you're almost out of control when you get to the ball or you almost reach a ball. It is, it, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. But the majority of the time, you have to just stay engaged in the game the whole time. You have to know your distances, know how far away... You know the kicker is if it's a nine or the ten, and just get up and try and meet the ball. But you're right; if you're out of control, coming too far forward for it, it's a dangerous old skill. Sorry, Jamie. Jamie McMillan, we we've left you completely out of this. What was your favourite part when you were playing? Uh, thanks for asking. <laughs> I think it's you know you'd you'd, you'd finish the season, you went to the clubhouse, do. Do. and and you'd look up at the board, and you'd see your name there as top try scorer. I think that would be my you know you know your job's done. <laughs> You know, as a fellow back rower as well, you know it's, uh, it's it's a phenomenal feeling to know that you're you're on that board. So, what was your best season total, Jamie? Oh, uh, I think I think seven, mm-hmm. but I was a six, so I wasn't. Uh, ah, you um, did the groundwork, eh? Yeah, but I also got sent off one season, so I had a, I would have maybe scored more, but I had a a, a wee suspension there. What what was that for, Jamie? Uh, an outburst. Uh, but my dad was oh. the referee, so it was more of a family oh. issue. <laughs> Petulance. Petulance, as, a, as opposed yeah. to brutality. Yeah, I wasn't suspended by the league. I was suspended by my my dad, who was the referee. So uh, <laughs> the golden, the, exactly the golden days, the golden days. But just on on the 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 kick, the kicks and returning the kicks. One thing that I seem to have noticed that's crept into the game a little bit more is there seems to be more of a tendency now to maybe pat the ball back or batting the ball back instead of catching it is that something that's maybe becoming more tactical or potentially so a lot of this, a lot of what you'll see us do off box kicks is make them contestable so we try and chase them and try and win it back so sometimes you you're not going to catch that clean but it's sometimes best to try and get up and, and bat it back towards your side just so you've got a bit more of a chance it's it's about decision making though so you won't do it 
too far down the field, close to your own try line. But if if you can try and get it a wee bit further up the field, then creates a bit of chaos, which makes a difference. But yeah, I'd say first prize is catching it clean. But then if you can bat it back towards your own side, then it's better than them catching it. Yeah, you see it a lot in sevens, don't you? Like, um, yeah, and it, it's a risk because basically defense coaches. Um, won't want it because they want structure, they want organisation, they want clarity and understanding of what's going to happen. But as soon as you slap a ball and the ball bounces left, right and centre and you're not sure where it's going, you get unstructured play. So it, it's a risk, but sometimes it works. But you will see it in sevens quite a lot because it's so difficult if you're coming up to try and catch one hand, stretching for it, and you've planned for it, you can you know have your players backwards. And it's not just a tap back, it's a proper thump yes. back, isn't it? It can carry yeah. eight or ten metres. So it's a, it's a risk, but if it means you're getting possession or there's a higher chance of getting possession than you would be just letting the opposition catch it, I think it's worth going for. But not a lot of defensive coaches will like that one, Jamie. They'll, uh, they'd, they'd rather they no, have a, no, a, start, no, a physical true. starting point. It's true. I think with sevens as well, if you, if you bat it back, there's not ever that many of the other team behind the ball. So you can afford yeah, to do it a little bit more in sevens, whereas in 15s you've got potentially guys coming trying to get back on side okay so if we can just go back a little bit to uh, look at the six nations and now we have to caveat the six nations isn't over yet there's still going to be that game against wales and cardiff at some point this year uh but jamie it just seemed a little bit like scotland were starting to get the momentum going uh, potentially if that game were going ahead and we'd won in cardiff would have been three wins on the bounce um just talk us through the six nations from your point of view and, and sum it up for us so far yeah, I think we, we took a lot of confidence going into that game in Cardiff. We really felt that we were in a, a really good position to go there and and create our own little bit of history. I think um, we started off pretty well down in Ireland. I think we probably should have won that game. Um, from a personal point of view, I think we were the better side. But it was just a few bits that we, we probably could have done a wee bit better. Our finish zone conversion could have been a lot better. We could have held on to the ball a wee bit more down there. But I think we created more chances. England was a bit of a dead rubber. I don't think it was. I think that could have gone on a toss of a coin, to be honest. Just with the weather and everything, any any side that scored first was probably going to win that. So um, we could we could have maybe managed the game a bit better. England just seemed to kick the ball every time they got it, which meant that we were in our half a lot of the time. Um, Italy was a better performance. I think we 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 went over there and we we put a lot of our pressure on ourselves to win because I think we needed to win and. We went over and did well, and then um, France was just a great performance, I think. And uh, the red card, I don't think would have made much of this. I think we still would have won that game. Yeah, we need to make, we need to just address the elephant in the room, which was that red card, because you've you were uh, involved in that. I mean, I think he must have regretted this decision straight away because I think you connected with your metal plate and, you, and your cheek, did he not? <laughs> yeah, um, no, he did. But, he did. <laughs> how did that all come about? Because um, it was kind of it wasn't it was kind of off the balls in the background but just talk us through from your side how it kind of all unfolded uh, oh, as far as I was what I saw was four French people around Nick Haining so and they were pushing each other and whatever and so I ran in probably a bit too hard to be honest uh, ran in pushed one of them <laughs> <laughs> uh, pushed one of them took him to yes, the floor good, good honesty Um Took him to the floor and then um, the guy lifted me up off my feet and banged me in the face. So I was a bit surprised. I didn't. I wasn't expecting. I'd, I'd grabbed him as well as he was pulling me up just to try and keep him at arm's length. And then his fist came flying towards me. And then there's not really much you can do there. I got taken to the floor um, and it kind of just kicked off a bit. It wasn't. It's not. It's to be fair. It's something. That whenever you go into these things, you never expect that anything's actually going to happen. Like it's all just handbags and it's the first proper punch I've seen in a long time. Yeah, well, it was a yeah, it was a good punch to be fair to him. But you didn't go down though. You went down because you got tackled. Let's just caveat that right now. <laughs> Cheers, Jamie. Cheers. You t- yeah, you took you took it well, t- Jamie. You and I spoke after the game, and um, for anybody like watching Jamie play, what I love about the way and. I'm going to embarrass you here, but it's okay. We're not in the same room. Is you are <laughs> constantly just niggling people. You're, you're like you a bit like 
been many players over the years. Robert Harley probably won for Glasgow that I played with. Just constantly pushing oh, wow. people's buttons <laughs> so that everybody everybody wants to hit you, which is a brilliant thing. Like because then if discipline does bubble over, then you, you see what happens. And I, I've got a first hand experience of this playing against you. Um, I think it's probably the only time we played against each other. Maybe not. Maybe anyway, eighteen seventy two backup game. Glasgow Edinburgh backup game on a Monday night. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just after you you'd signed for Edinburgh, um, six months into it or so, and the game the 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 main game was on a Saturday and it was a Monday night game. Do you do you remember it? No, nah, it doesn't remember. Doesn't it's remember. A it. Oh, it's a highlight. <laughs> there was two hours. There was one at Stirling. No, there was one at um... County win. Yeah, and then there was That's one right, at, uh, No, it wasn't well. the Stanley County one. It was it was the back pitches of ETM and uh, yeah, yeah. and you did exactly and I was only meant to play forty odd minutes. Um and the reason I remember it so vividly, and I think we've spoken about it on this, it was it was the exact moment I decided to retire. Um <laughs> Because I played, I played in that game, and you and um, another few people were just niggling the whole time, just niggling, and it was pouring down with rain, it was freezing cold, and I got in a big Jason White's car afterwards, who was my agent at the time, and Jason says, right, what, what were we thinking? There was a couple of things that were potential options for the next season. I says, Jason, I'm done. Never again. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> and it was mostly because of you, so thanks. Thanks, for <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks. Well, you're doing all right, aren't you, so... You are. <laughs> yeah, we're doing okay. <laughs> no, I was just saying I don't I don't go out to, to like niggle anyone or um it's just something that tends to happen. I think people get annoyed if you you, you just get in the way and try and do like little bits around the park like clear rocks or try and stay on the ball for a wee bit too long and it tends to, to rub people up the wrong way and I'm not that I'm not that into fighting or anything like that. I'll, but I'll always stand up for myself and my teammates so if it comes down to it then I'm not afraid to to get in someone's face but nobody needs to be into fighting it mostly makes this point all the time nobody fights in a rugby partner you you, you that punch is a very and it's right we shouldn't see it so we don't see it very often at all but what you do brilliantly is just push people enough that discipline issues might creep in and it's very unlikely to be a punch but it, it could be somebody bubbling over and doing something they wouldn't ordinarily do um, you you play the game both physically but psychologically as well, and like I'm I'm uh, I'm giving you a pause here because I love watching it. I think it's brilliant, uh, and those are the guys that I wanted to play with as well. The guys who Mossy had it in him as well. Like he he talks about making breaks <laughs> from the back. He was a mongrel at times as well, <laughs> and he'd be, he'd be in poking people in the ribs. Uh, steady Al. No, listen, I, I agree. I think I think now more than ever. Players that have the ability to do that but keep their own head are absolutely essential. You know, you, you almost... I, I think it was more reactive back when I started playing and when I was playing, there was kind of a lot of reactive stuff went on. Now I think you actually have to focus on being that person, doing all you can, as Jamie says, all you can for yourself, for your teammates, whatever needs done at that time. But then almost with a kind of a reset button in the back of your mind saying, listen, don't bubble, bubble over, just keep it, keep it, keep it. Um, and, and I wonder if that's coached. I think I think that the, the the aggressions inside you—it's innate in every some every single person that plays rugby. It is. It's there. It's part of the love of it. It's what you need in order to succeed. But I wonder if the the ability to stay calm when it looks like you're out of control is coached, or if that's just innate as well. I'm not sure. I think it's probably innate. I think it comes down to the the, the personality of the person as well. Uh, Clearly, you can learn some of it, and you see guys learning it throughout their career. Your, your, your point about keeping calm, that has got to be the most important one as well. Like You do see guys, and I was probably one of them when I first started. Uh, I was on the bench for Edinburgh when I was kind of early 20s, and I'd come on for, say, 20 minutes or whatever it was at the end of a game. Um, and the first thing you did, or I did, was give away a penalty because I was just so eager to get into the game and just trying to do things that I shouldn't have been doing. So you've just got to make sure you get that balance. And for me, it's probably a bit of maturity as well. As you get older, you get better at doing it. So, Jamie, we've talked a little bit about you beyond the field, but let's go off the field. We know you've got a, a young family. Uh, you know, your father, you, I think you had your first kid when you were, you were 19. At the same time, you had your rugby career going in the background and you've you've really kicked on uh, on the pitch there. <laughs> As a young father, how challenging was that juggling kind of personal life and and, and your professional life? Because at that age, it couldn't have been really easy, was it? 
Uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, it, it wasn't easy, but I think becoming a dad when I did probably helped me quite a lot in terms of my rugby. I think mm. as, a, as a young man and as a young rugby player, I've seen it where guys can get caught up where they, they're just concentrated on rugby constantly and then their, right, their life revolves around how that's going. So for guys, if they get a, an injury, then it affects the rest of their life in terms of like, because they're not playing rugby, then the rest of their life is affected. So they can't do a lot of stuff. Whereas for me, whenever I got home, like I had to completely switch off rugby because I had my job at home where I needed to be on it for the kids. I needed to be present. I couldn't be worrying about what was going on at, with rugby. And that's probably helped me quite a lot because I can get caught up in my head about quite a lot of things in terms of my performances and how what could have done differently but when you go home you have to concentrate on the kids and I couldn't afford to get caught up in that so I think it for me it was it was it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me and it is the best thing that's happened to you because I love my kids to bits and but I think for me to be able to do that and have my kids when I did my partner was massive like she took a lot of the the workload on in terms of the kids and let me sleep and was be able to prepare for games and stuff like that. So I owe a lot to her for what she's done for me in terms of that. So I'm very grateful. So this time, this period where we're all in lockdown is probably my opportunity to make it up a wee bit. And just looking ahead to the future, Jamie, we know it's quite difficult to do that at the moment in the current situation that we're all, we're all facing. But what's been the messaging from Edinburgh? I saw a couple of photos of some of the strength and conditioning guys dropping off some some bikes and some kit to a few guys' houses and what they're not. But what are you doing to keep in shape and, and how difficult is it for you to keep in shape, not really knowing when you're going to recommence things? Uh, it's pretty difficult. I mean, for us, I think it comes down to a lot of personal pride. So guys wouldn't let themselves get into too bad a shape. To be honest, uh, as you saw on social media, uh, the SNC staff were around at boys' houses dropping off all the kit and stuff so they can they can keep the bodies ticking over. But obviously, we've not got access to everything that we would have had access to if we were still training at Murrayfield, BT Murrayfield. And um, yeah, look, it, it's difficult, but there's finding ways around it. So there's plenty of body weight exercises you can do. The kit that you have been given, there's different ways in which you can use it. You can. You can be a bit inventive with it and and taking the opportunity to to let the body rest as well, I think is important. Like potentially this will be the longest period of time guys have had off in a, in quite a while. So letting the body kind of recharge and reset and getting lots of sleep and eating well. Like for me personally, I know I've I've done a lot more cooking in the last two weeks than I have done in the last two years. Um, which I really enjoy and, it, and it's meant that I can eat things that I want to eat I can eat well and and it, it, it's probably making a, a huge difference this might be adding years on to some boys careers just because of the rest that we're getting and the time that we can take to get our bodies into into decent shape and not we don't need to stay on the horse constantly like boys will take days off I'm sure but as long as they're keeping themselves taking over so that when it does come time to to get back into it boys aren't starting from scratch well, Jamie Ritchie, it's been brilliant having you on the podcast this week. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, stay safe during this uncertain period, but enjoy the time at home. And we all look forward to seeing you back on our big fetch very soon. Cheers, mate. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jamie. Brilliant, Jamie. Thanks very much. Well, it's brilliant to get Jamie Ritchie on the podcast. He's, he's always a great guy to talk to. And now, interestingly, your point about... Um, when you played against him, quite a niggly guy. But off the field, um, he is one of the nicest guys you can you can work with and, and be around, isn't he? Absolute gentleman. And I, I, the maturity of him as well. For, for, what is he? Is he 23, 24 years old? Like, just the way he carries himself, conducts himself, both on the part, but also off the part, to your point. like he, He's fantastic. For me, he's a future Scotland captain as well. Like he, and I don't think it'll be... Uh, a long way it could easily be the guy after Stuart Hogg um, he's just got that aura about him that he, he takes people with him so yeah I, I think he's he's a fantastic player but yeah fantastic to have uh, uh, time in his company off the park as well yeah I've, I've, I've known Jamie for a long time as well working with the age group stuff um, and he was he's always been like that he's always been a tremendous player a tremendous uh, bloke he is just exactly that, you know. He's, he, we're lucky to have him, um, but he's also improved his game massively. I mean, he's always had a huge amount of talent, but one of the not the criticism, one of the things he had to work on was his discipline in and around the the the, the game, giving away penalties, being 
as we spoke about, kind of over over eager to win penalties or win turnovers, and um, that was one of the things that it, it's quite hard to do. Often to improve as a player, you sometimes have to get better at things uh, or work harder. But in that circumstance, you're almost working less hard to get better at it. You know, you're almost pulling yourself out of a situation where you're so desperate to get involved in. Um, so it becomes decision making, it becomes about maturity. Um, and as you say, I get, this last two years, I think the his last two Six Nations campaigns, probably more, he's been utterly outstanding and just um, I agree with Al, definitely a leader uh, for the future. Delighted now to be joined by Director of Rugby Development, Sheila Begbie, and Competition and Compliance Manager, Vicky Cox. Thank you very much both for joining us here on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast. Some huge news this week in regards to the domestic rugby season in Scotland being classified as null and void. Sheila, I'll I'll come to you first. Um, What, I guess, is the decision regarding promotion and relegation and and league titles uh, with this, this announcement? Um, With this announcement, it means that there's no automatic promotion and relegation this season um, for clubs. We conducted through Vicky um, an extensive consultation process which involved clubs, championship committees, regional committees, a council board and, of course, our rugby development department as well. This has been a really, really difficult decision, which we we know it will disappoint some of the clubs uh, just in terms of their performance over the season. But it was a decision that was favoured by the majority of the the clubs and the majority of of those who were involved in the actual consultation process. Um, So there'll be no promotion, no relegation and no titles. And really that decision was was made because we needed a sort of clear and consistent approach across all the the leagues and across the whole country, just in terms of the interest of the integrity of the game. Yeah, you mentioned the, the, the process. It was a very difficult one. Vicky, can you just tell us a little bit more detail around how you came to this decision and what that process would look like? Sure. So um, at the time that the season was suspended, um, I remember thinking back, what on earth do we do now? Um, with over or approximately 300 matches remaining across every league and no one league yet completed, we were faced with a situation that was completely unprecedented. So to begin with, we looked at the options of being able to fill the remaining fixtures um, ahead of the forthcoming season with some teams such as East Kilbride or Garnock in West 1 with eight matches remaining or Falkirk in National 2 with seven. The impact to the start date for season 2021 would have been significantly um, or significant um, indeed as players would have needed time to train, to be contact ready and match fit before playing the continuation of season 1920, which would have then delayed the process or the start date for the next season, which would have then continued well into May and June next year with fewer, if any, breaks. So in consideration of that, we opted to conclude the season and not carry any fixtures over into the summer once the the suspension had been lifted, which even now is still an unknown as to when that might be. So the next step in the process was to consider how we might then approach resolving season 1920, um, either awarding points uh, for remaining fixtures, averaging points, or counting earlier fixtures as double headers. We modelled all of these different scenarios in order to conclude the season. And in taking these options, we would effectively be artificially resolving promotion and relegation. We even considered looking at promotion and relegation based on the current league standings at the point when the season was suspended. And we also considered as a final option whether or not to promote and relegate teams where it had been mathematically proven that upon completion of all fixtures that that team would have won the league. Um, whilst we know there would have been teams hugely disappointed to not have been offered this particular option as our decision, um, we had to appreciate that there would be a change to the format of some of the competitions, effectively creating an 11-team premiership next season, which under the bylaws, a change to the format of the premiership and the national leagues would require a three-stage consultation, as well as council approval and a general meeting. So this option was eliminated from the process, as that was something that we can't do given the circumstances we're in. We can't hold a general meeting. Um, So in line with all of that, we actually took those remaining options that we could proceed with and we actually asked the championship and competition competition committees to share their remaining options with us 
and share their feedback as to whether whether or not there'd be one preferred option over another. And that feedback from the clubs was full and null and void. And whilst it wasn't the only option that we got the feedback from, it was by far the most popular. Sure. Um, Vicky mentioned uh, the um, promotion and relegation. I, I would imagine the, the, the clubs who are in the strongest permission uh, position for promotion were the ones that emotionally anyway were most affected by this um, how, how difficult a, a consultation period was that? It was an absolutely difficult um, consultation period, we know that all of the clubs have put in a, a lot of preparation in terms of you know their pre-season as you say all the emotional bit of, of actually getting success on the pitch thinking that you're going to get promotion and then suddenly we're hit by something that is worldwide pandemic in terms of COVID-19, something that we've never seen on this scale ever before. So it was a huge decision to make. And as Vicky's already alluded to, it was a really big consultation process that involved all the key stakeholders in the game. Um, you know, so actually all of the clubs in Scotland are, that, that participate in our competitions are um, impacted on by this decision. But as you say, you know, if, if a club was playing and still thought that they had promotion opportunities then that 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 must be really difficult for them and, and we do we do feel the disappointment and um, myself and, and the president Dee Bradbury, Bradbury have written to five clubs in particular that have been impacted on by this decision in terms of not gaining or not winning uh, the league so it, it is a decision as we said earlier on we it's we've not taken it lightly we understand the commitment from all of the clubs we understand the resource that's gone into the clubs participating in the, the competition season. Um, but unfortunately, in these really tough times, sometimes you need to make really hard decisions. And this was probably one of the hardest decisions that we'll ever ha have to make. And hopefully we don't have to make a decision decision like this in the future. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a no-win situation really all around. And it's good to know that the, the consultation with the clubs and the committees was, was a way forward. Do you think there'll be any clubs when the dust settles that, that see this as an opportunity to, to underline the potential success they may have had this season that, and that's going to really drive them for for success next season? Or do you think it's just going to hurt so much that it'll cause a, a negative effect? And if that is the case, what support um, would Scottish Rugby be, be willing to to share the, the, the club hardship fund, for example, may come into the, the equation there. But there's two ways of looking at it if you're a club, isn't there? There's that there's that motivational spike that comes from a disappointment or there's the the other way where it's, um, it's just so demoralising. I personally believe that competition is part of our human nature. So those players who have significantly gone out of their way to pursue a promotion position this season will certainly be in a position to want to prove that point again. So that, that that element of competition will drive them forward and we would hope to see the same successes next season. And Vicky, just on, on that, I get a little bit going back to the process. You mentioned you know, the consultation process. Were all the clubs consulted on this? All clubs um, were contacted by their regional competition committee reps or their national competition committee reps um, and through that dialogue, we um, got a significant amount of feedback from most clubs, not all. We did, there were some clubs that didn't respond to um, the correspondence that, that we received, but it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was encouraging to hear the feedback. It was encouraging to, um, for them to be involved in this process with us. And I guess, Sheila, overall, you, you might have touched on it already, but what is your message to the clubs? You know, this is, as you mentioned, a pandemic. Nobody could have planned for this, but what, what would you like to say and what is your message to these clubs involved? I would just really say to the clubs that these really are unprecedented times and, you know, we're living through um, a pandemic that's that's actually impacting on all of our daily lives. So to our clubs, we would really ask in terms of protecting them and for their own safety that they follow Scottish Government and UK Government messages about staying at home, um, saving lives and protecting our health service. But what I would say in all of this is that we have to put people first. Um, so I would say that our concern and care is for players, coaches and volunteers in our club game. And we would ask them very much to take care of themselves, to look after themselves, to take care of their loved ones. We look forward to seeing everybody once we get through this really challenging period. 
And in the meantime, for clubs with any financial concerns, we've opened the Club Hardship Fund and we would welcome applications to support clubs. Um, I would also say that in terms of our regional teams, our regional teams are there to support clubs. If they've got any concerns, we would ask them to reach out to the regional teams. We're here to support the clubs in these really difficult and challenging times that we have. But most of all, we would say to our people in our clubs, please stay healthy and please stay safe. Well, Sheila Begbie, Director of Rugby Development and Vicky Cox, Competition and Compliance Manager at Scottish Rugby. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast and explaining in great detail around the process of the round 2019-20 season. Thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and we'll speak to you very soon. Don't forget the application window for the Royal Bank Rugby Force is now open. To be in with a chance to win practical and financial support to kickstart your club season, search Royal Bank Rugby Force. That's all from us here on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast. We'll be back very soon with more exclusive content.